When I was growing up, there was a lady in our community. She worshipped somewhere else, but I would see her out in the community, and wherever she was, whatever anybody would say, she'd say, well, praise God anyway. And I thought, as a young kid, that was kind of silly. So and so sick. Well, praise God anyway. Did you hear that so and so passed away last night? Well, praise God anyway. But you know, there is such wisdom in that. You're going to praise God in the good times, but he's worthy of your praise at all times. When your heart feels like it, when it doesn't, when things are going good, when things are going bad, when the church is full, when the church might be sick, when the, when the, when the country is anxious about sickness, in all things, praise God anyway. Somebody say amen. And try to remember that. Just be thankful for what he's doing in your life in addition to the things that you might not like because God is worthy of our praise. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we pray you would protect Louisa from sickness. But we've had colds and flus throughout the winter time and we realize that in this world, good days and bad days will come. Tornadoes will hit at the worst possible places and do damage our world is broken. Our world has problems. And so you came into our world to give hope to your children. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would fill our hearts with your peace, with joy, because no matter what happens to us here, we have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we are heaven bound. Now, Lord, we confess we're not in any big rush to get to our mansion. And there's a part of us that fears the process of death. But we no longer fear death itself, for you have promised us the best part of our life begins when we see you face to face to worship you forever and ever in heaven. Where, O oh death, is your sting? It has been crucified with Jesus on the cross of Calvary. So I pray, Lord, that as we are cautious and careful as wise people would be, that you might also remind us to be joyful for you live our days with us. As you cause to come to our memory things that we should repent of, that we did this week that we shouldn't have done, or things we left undone that should have been done this week, as we confess those things to you, forgive us, Lord. And thank you for being gracious to allow us time to grow in to the holy things of God. We will never be worthy. We will never be perfect in this world. But we hunger and thirst to hit that bullseye of perfection simply because you are worthy of our best. May we be gracious to others when they miss the mark. May we be a model of patience and kindness with our children and our family, our neighbors, our spouses. And may our minds be set on the holy things of God. Give us your peace, Lord. Keep us healthy or give us the strength to go through whatever you choose to allow us to go through. And lead us, Lord, from this place where we are to our ultimate destiny in your holy presence. Thank you for the plan of redemption that includes us and the hope we have in our heart because Jesus lives in us. In that spirit, Lord, we pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I said before, our choir is in forced temporary vacation. 
but they will be back. And they'll be welcoming you to sing the congregational hymns with them uh, in, the, in the weeks to come. That'll, that'll be something some of you grew up with where you had a volunteer choir. They'll be inviting others to come up and sing with them on another day. Let's turn our attention at present to the scripture of the morning. And you might not realize how important that is, but tucked in the third chapter of John is an old, old friend of yours. Would you stand in honor of God's word as we read it together? Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can, can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases and you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God, listen to this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Boys and girls, it's children's time. Hopefully there's somebody back there ready to rock your world. Okay, so you saw my truck out front perhaps with a trailer attached to it and you're saying, what in the world is he doing? Well, Friday, I went to Louisville and I loaded up 200 gallons of the brand new plastic bottle. The large bottle is now gonna be in plastic. It's got a brand new label and the ingredients have been, there was a type of, I misspelled kitchen and it's been misspelled for several years. I got the typo fixed. I put the Kentucky Proud logo on it because that was real important to my sister. And I took 200 gallons of sauce to Scottsville and unloaded it in the dark, spent the night with my mom. And then yesterday I got up and visited a few friends and then headed home. And I got home about 10.30ish having lost an hour as I was heading into the Eastern time zone, knowing this morning at 2 a.m. I would lose another hour, so there aren't pretty pictures during this sermon because I was otherwise employed, but they will be back a different time. The sermon's ready to go, the slides are not, so there aren't any slides today. But what a wonderful time to be reminded of one of those passages in scriptures, and I know you can quote, Jesus wept, but if you're not a biblical scholar, and most of you say, you're not biblical scholars. Surely, you know John 3.16 about as well as you know Jesus wept. And here it is in our lectionary reading today. There was a meeting that happened between a significant Jewish leader and Jesus. 
The leader, a Pharisee, was named Nicodemus. There was more than one character in the Bible named Nicodemus. This Nicodemus was a powerful man, a leader in the Jewish council. He had power and influence. He had seen Jesus before. He had heard and seen what Jesus was doing. A leader in the synagogue would know when the Messiah comes, you will have people healed and transformed the dead will rise and those that are lame will be walking. The blind will see. He had watched all of those things. He knows the prophets. He knows Jesus is doing those things that the Messiah will do when he comes. And he came at night to talk to Jesus. Now preachers make a great deal out of that. And we're all conjecturing what exactly does it mean that it came at night. But you will notice in the scriptures that those who hated him, those that challenged him, they came during broad daylight and confronted him in front of witnesses. I think Nicodemus wanted one-on-one -on -one time with the one that he believed to be the Messiah. So he came at night not to confront, but to discover, to listen, to, to learn, what Jesus was all about. Um, he believed Jesus, I believe, for what that's worth. But he didn't want his friends to know he was there. Now we'll stop right there for just a second because maybe you can relate to that. When I was in high school in the early to mid 70s, a lot of the people in my high school class went to church somewhere. But nobody talked about it, including me. No one talked about it. And so if I visited a church for a revival or a youth something and I went into an unknown church, I would discover my own peers in that church and would discover in the worship service, not only are they believers, but they worship at this place. And at school, we tried to make sure it didn't show. Perhaps in your life, maybe even to this day, Someone who sees you in the public sphere might not necessarily know that you're a believer. Your Christian friends might not know about your, your other friends, and your other friends might not know that you're a part of a youth group or a congregation or whatever. It, prob it shouldn't be that way. Our light should be shining. But even Nicodemus didn't want his friends to know that he was spending time with Jesus. I think you and I maybe can relate to that. There were opportunities for us to let our light shine and we just turn the switch off and let that opportunity pass. And so Nicodemus came by night to have this private conversation with Jesus and Jesus said to them, to him, you must be born again. That's an expression that we use all the time in the 21st century. And to be quite frank, to people who hear it, who don't have a church background, that is a confusing phrase, born again. Nicodemus was thinking very literally, as some of us maybe do in life. How do you go back and born again? Jesus was talking about something spiritual. Nicodemus only had knowledge of physical birth, which he might have seen his own children being born. How can that be? Let me be clear. Born again means a spiritual change where you start your life over, forgiven, living for God. It means starting over, or as I oftentimes will say if you were playing baseball in the backyard of somebody's house, it's a do-over, a do-over. Now, during our basketball season, we have a referee and she'll call a foul and people will do whatever they do, but if you're in the back lot of somebody's house or you're playing basketball or baseball or whatever and there's a sub disputed call, do it again, play it over. That's the best way to solve fights. In the spiritual world, being born again is to start your life over. When it happened to Saul of Tarsus, he changed his name. And you see Saul being called Paul for the rest of his life. He changed his name because his heart was different. And when this process began to happen to your preacher, 
Danny became Dan. And at the wedding, you will hear people calling me Danny because they've known me for 62-ish years and it will happen. It used to annoy me because I want Danny to be gone. I know who Danny was and what Danny did and what Danny didn't do. I would rather not be Danny. I don't think of myself as Danny. I think of myself as Dan. But if you come to the wedding, you're going to hear cousins call me by that old name, the name they knew me by before God did a regenerative work in my heart. Perhaps you can relate to that. For you once lived a certain way, and now you live a different way because you have been forgiven. Jesus said to Nicodemus, born again means starting over again. You must be born again. Now it's more than baptism. Billy Sunday used to preach up and down in these big tent revivals and, and he was famous for saying that going to church doesn't make you automatically a Christian any more than sitting in your garage makes you a Ford Model T. We're not talking about being baptized in water like it has magical power. We're not talking about deciding to join our church instead of being a visitor. We're not talking about showing up at church instead of sitting at home in your jammies watching a TV preacher and eating Cheetos. Those, those changes are significant, but that's not what born again is. It's more than taking vows. It's more than having your name on a roll someplace. And I haven't noticed in Eastern Kentucky because we don't have as many newspapers as we used to, but throughout my career around and about, there is a thing that people say in their obituaries when they have a warmness toward the church but not a lot of experience. Maybe you can recall where somebody passed and it says they are of the Catholic tradition or they are of the Methodist faith or they are of the Baptist faith. That is code for they didn't go very much and you might not know this but they were once connected to a church somehow and what we're talking about here is more than having your name on a roll or going under the water. You know, I was mean to Karen. When Karen got baptized recently, the devil came into me as I put her under the water. And I pushed her under and just held her there till her eyes got real big and kind of looked kind of panicky. And then I let her up and she was spitting and sputtering. And She's not going to forget that I baptized her because I baptized her slow. But just because you're baptized does not mean you're born again. Just because you're Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or Lutheran or whatever, just because your name's on a roll, that's not what Jesus is talking about. It's more than baptism. It's more than vows. It's more than hearing a sermon and going to an altar and praying a prayer once. Perhaps you have an experience or you've seen it in others where somebody goes to an altar and prays a prayer as someone helps them to pray a prayer and they go home to live like the devil. <laughs> I have buddies like that who are obviously not living a Christian life but they said a prayer and they made some promises that they aren't keeping and they are a little confused as to whether or not they're in or they're out when they die. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit of God bears forth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Praying that prayer is not the same as being born again. But when you are born again, God has a beautiful way of saying to you, No, my child, you're not perfect. But you are forgiven. And if you were to die today, you would be coming home to me. You must be born again. Nicodemus asked the question, how, how can this be? And he was very literal, wasn't he? And Jesus told Nicodemus, the kingdom of God requires a change of your heart, change of your spirit. And then he used an analogy that we can all relate to. The Holy Spirit is like the wind. 
Now, there were a few vacations when my girls were in elementary school where we'd go to western Kentucky and rent a sailboat and sail around. And, and my, my, my family's eyes would get great big because they told me at the dock, this boat will not flip. So I put it to the test because I was a fool. Now, there was one boat that I borrowed from a friend and took it, and he didn't say it couldn't flip because it could, and I did, and scared them to death, and it might be the last time we were ever on a sailboat. But if you get on a, a, a boat that's not designed to capsize with ballast, heavy ballast in the bottom, that ship can go so far over you would just swear that you're getting ready to die. But it doesn't capsize because you are safe. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the, what I'm talking about, Nicodemus, is like the wind. You can't see it coming. You can't see where it goes, but it's powerful. Now, my mom, living an hour north of Nashville, all she's heard in the news all this week is the tornado that went through Nashville. It's all she wanted to talk about Friday night. Saturday morning, we're making bacon talking about the tornado that went through Nashville. I know more about that tornado than I should know living on the edge of West Virginia. I know that it cut through a heavily populated area 50 miles long. I know that my favorite barbecue restaurant in Mount Juliet is probably flat as a fritter. I know that the Wilson County school system east of Nashville has stopped teaching for the rest of the year. And I asked the question, rest of the year? They've called off classes for the rest of the year? Why in the world? And she said, the buildings are gone. Trying to envision that kind of devastation. It's mind blowing, but I saw a picture taken from the top of Vanderbilt Hospital and I didn't really understand what I was seeing. I was used to seeing that uh, a Wizard of Oz kind of tornado. It's big at the top and it's smaller at the bottom and it does this kind of thing. But the picture that they showed was this big rectangular darkness coming toward Nashville. And I found out from my mother that it was a mile across. A mile across through the eastern side of Nashville and toward those other metropolitan areas one mile of devastation that goes for 50 miles my mind can barely get around it such is the power of the invisible wind in some tornadoes, you can't even see the wind. You just see things being transformed by it. My brother-in-law owns a used car dealership, and he buys most of his vehicles from a place. He bought most of his cars from a, a place on the east side of Nashville. 300 acres of cars, destroyed or gone. Don't go to Bowling Green, Kentucky and try to good, get a good price on a used car this afternoon. Whatever wasn't damaged has just gone up hugely because of an invisible, violent wind. And Jesus says, the Spirit of God is like the wind. You don't see where it's coming from. You don't see where it's going. You see the effects of it, and it is powerful. Such is the Spirit of God when it comes into our life. It is impossible, I suspect, for that Spirit of God to, 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 to come across us without us being changed somehow. Something like that doesn't blow through our life without changing the words we speak, the thoughts that we think. It forces us to go with God or turn our back on him and go in a different direction. You got to deal with that wind. It is powerful. Such it is, Jesus said to Nicodemus, with the Holy Spirit, invisible, but transformational, powerful. And then he took it down to its lowest beautiful level. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus is saying those words about himself. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, Nicodemus, should not perish, but have eternal life. Power to be better. Power to be new. Power to be forgiven. Power to go from death to eternal life. What does God want from us? Let's pretend even in this crowd that's a little smaller today that there's somebody here listening to a sermon maybe for the very first time. What does God want from us? What did God want from you whenever it happened and that wind came into your life and you gave your life to Christ? What, is, what does it mean to you? Number one, it means the truth. God wants the truth from us. I'm dressed in a suit and tie, me and Bob, suit and tie. Well, and, and Bob, the two Bobs and myself, suit and tie. He wants us to clean up the outside, look presentable, but he also wants us to confess the darkness within that he knows is there. I have heard somebody once in my lifetime say to God on, at the altar, I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm going to live for you. And it was said with a certain amount of pride. I'm going to do you a favor, Lord. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that for you. It's like a negotiation where you're doing God a favor. The truth of the matter is God has done you a favor. He knows every sin you've ever committed your entire life and he's ready to take a wonderful eraser and erase it. But the first step is for you to be honest with God. I have sinned. I've left holy things undone. I've neglected to do the things I knew you wanted me to do. I've been rebellious. I've gone astray. Tell God the truth because the new life starts with honesty. Now, the wonderful thing about coming to Louisa or any other church where I don't know yet, the first Sunday I was here, I tried to fake it, tried to fake a certain amount of comfort, but it's uncomfortable to preach to a bunch of strangers when every word you say that said wrong, and I said a few words wrong, if you're from West Virginia, you might remember that. Every word I'm being said is going to be remembered and brought back to your attention later on. It's anxious times for a pastor to preach to the, first, to the new congregation. It's nervous for you too, right? Are we going to like this fella? Is he going to do this or that? What, what have we gotten ourselves into with this new pastor? Anxious times. When you come to God, since he knows everything, it is important that you are honest. I've made mistakes. This, this, and this that I'm thinking of right now. I need you. I'm unworthy of what I'm asking for. I know that. You're holy and I'm just me. Tell God the truth because that's where it starts. Secondly, Lord, I am sorry for who and what I have been and done. Sometimes when people come to the altar and pray to ask Jesus in their life, they might accidentally leave that part out. I am sorry for what I have done. Please forgive me. Now, there are two words that are difficult to say when you're in a spat with somebody else in your life. I'm sorry is hard to say. But there are three different words that are even more difficult to say, but they are powerful. Please forgive me. The first thing we want to do is deny we're guilty of anything, right? And if we're really big hearted, we'll say, I'm sorry. That's hard enough to say. But the most powerful words when you're in a dispute with someone else is, please forgive me. 
If you're thinking about asking Jesus into your life, if you are thinking about asking Jesus into your life, those three powerful words will change everything. Please forgive me. For the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He wants to forgive. Get honest with him. Tell him the truth and ask for what you need. You need to be forgiven for the brokenness in your life. I'm sorry, Lord. And third, to the best of your ability, live the life he's told you to live. Stop doing sinful things. Start doing holy things. Evaluate your peer group. If you can have an influence on them, stay with them. If they're dragging you back into addiction or sin or something, might be time for a different set of friends. Well, here's the good news. When you come to church, one of the side benefits is you make a whole new bunch of friends you might not have had before. And you tend to be a very forgiven group of folks. Amen and hallelujah for you. Now, we know everything in the world about somebody's past and their family and where they grew up and what they did 40 years ago, but you have a wonderful way of not blaming some child for the sins of their father or grandfather. It is not that way everywhere. Let it not be that way here ever again. Let someone lay down their old life and bury those memories of brokenness that you saw in this teeny tiny town and let them be new in Christ. That's what you and I needed and that's what they need today. Let them change and be free. Live and lift up Christ. There's something I do in, in marital counseling where I'll just say to somebody, hold your hand up. And they put their hand up and I put my hand to theirs. I won't do it in the next few weeks with the virus and all. But I will push against their hand. For some of you, maybe I've done this to you. I push against their hand. And then I push harder. And then I push less hard. And if you can imagine me doing this to you right now, imagine I'm touching your hand and then I'm pushing a little bit. What is your automatic response? You push back a little bit. And if I push harder, do you do one of these? No, it's amazing. When, when I push harder against your hand, you push a little harder against my hand. It's like there's a rule that I haven't stated that there's this line that we're supposed to maintain. If I push harder, you push back to it goes, and then you stop at that invisible line where we started. And when I ease up, you ease up. Now, I bring that up because in marital counseling, it suggests the fact that if your husband or wife won't come to counseling, but you change the way you interact with your spouse, it automatically causes a change in them as well. Go home and try it with your spouse. Push your, well, you can't do that now because they're sitting there beside you. But when you change the way you treat the world, the world changes the way it treats you too. And you can't change your past, but you can change your present. And when you change your present, it automatically changes your future. Ponder that for just a second. You can't change your past. Lord, I wish I could. But I can change my present. I can change the way I treat God. And when I change the way I treat God, it changes my relationship with him and with the world. When I stop saying certain words, when I stop thinking certain things on the basis of color or ethnic background or all those prejudices that are out there, when I just start loving people because they're people, then little kids I don't remember start grabbing me by the leg and smiling. And last Saturday at the Rock Sports, this, this whole group of people that I assumed to be family members they knew my name, and I didn't even know where I had seen them before. But what a blessing. 
they were loving on me and I couldn't even remember why. But the ministry we've been doing in the community put a smile on their face. They remembered names and began to express love to us. Like the wind. You can't see it, but you can feel its power. If you will change toward God and the world, the world will change for the good. I want to leave you with this illustration. A, a, a young man was on the edge of an ocean beach early in the morning, and the tide had come in, and the starfish had gotten up on the sand, and the tide went out, and the starfish were destined to die there on the beach. They couldn't get back into the water, and the sun was going to come out. And so early in the morning, he's picking up starfish, and he's throwing them out into deep water, picking up another and throwing them out in the deep water, picking them up and throwing them out into the deep water. And an old scraggly man like some of you have met in your life walked down the beach and saw this young idealistic man saving starfish. And he looked at the miles of beach in front of him and the miles behind him. He looked at the boy and he shook his head cynically like some of us might do and said, son, you can't make a difference. The boy took it in. He smiled, a strange smile. He reached down again and grabbed a starfish and slung it into the water. And he said, I changed that one. That is what God calls us to do. We can't stop a virus. We can't stop wars from breaking out. We can't keep it from being dangerous to leave your house unlocked at night. But when you change how you interact with the world, the world begins to change. When you are born again, the world begins to change for the glory of God. You must be born again or we're without hope. But when you live your life for Christ, you'll see fruit coming back that you did not intend because the power of God changes those around you for the good. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You must be born again. Father, take those seeds that I have just planted. May they come to life and grow in each of our hearts. For only we know what lies deep within us, what darkness, what harbored sin, what Things that are not of you still reside within our heart. Reach into that deepest place. Forgive us, transform us, and make us new. Your promise is that we can start our whole life over again. And Lord, I've seen it. Not just in my own heart, but in the lives of others around me. I've seen it in this place people starting their life over, sometimes changing even their name. Lord, may it be true for each of us listening at this moment. May we be born again. Prepare us for eternal life by being not just our Savior, but our Lord and King. We open our heart to you, Father. We pray that you would cause to happen within us your good and perfect will for our good and for yours. We open our hearts to you, Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen.
Would you please stand for our closing hymn, The Altar?